Section 5 of Recollections of a Busy Life by William B. Forwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 Continued The Liverpool Exchange A great change has taken place in the Liverpool Exchange. In the early sixties the old exchange buildings were still in existence. The building which surrounded Nelson's monument was classic in design, with high columns surmounted by ionic capitals and a heavy cornice. The newsroom was in the east wing, with windows overlooking on the one side Exchange Street East, and on the other the flags. The room had two rows of lofty pillars supporting the ceiling and there was ample room in the various bays, not only for newspaper stands, but for chairs and tables, and it had very much more the appearance of a reading room in a club than its elaborate but less comfortable successor. On the western and northern side of the exchange were offices with warehouses overhead. The borough Bridewell stood in High Street, its site being now covered by Brown's buildings, and the Sessions House occupied part of the site upon which the newsroom now stands. In the sixties high change was in the afternoon, between four and five o'clock, but much business was also transacted during the morning. No merchant or broker considered that he could commence the work of the day until he had read the news on the pillars in the newsroom. Instead of the work on the exchange being done by clerks, it was transacted by the principals, who considered it only respectful to appear in a tall hat and frock coat. Although in those days there may have been a little too much formality in dress, in these there is sadly too little, and with the disappearance of the tall hat and frock coat one has also to regret the abandonment of those courtly manners and that respectful consideration which gave a charm to commercial intercourse and was not confined to the exchange and the office, but was reflected in the home and in private life. Merchant ship brokers and general produce brokers transacted their business in the newsroom, while the cotton brokers, braving all weathers, were to be found on the flags. The present newsroom was opened in 1867, and shortly afterwards the mayor, Mr. Edward Whitley, gave a ball in honor of Prince Arthur and the Prince and Princess Christian, the ballroom in the town hall being connected with the newsroom by a long corridor constructed of wood. Dancing took place in both rooms. Upon several occasions after a heavy fall of snow, fights with snowballs were waged on the flags, until, becoming serious, the police were obliged to interfere and put a stop to them. A playful, seasonable exchange of snowballs degenerated into a combat with the rougher element which frequented the flags. I still recall many of the habitués of the exchange from 1860 to 1870, men who well represented the varied interests of the great port. While frock coats and tall hats were the rule, many still wore evening dress coats, and not a few white cravats. There was old Miles Barton, a picturesque figure with his genial smile and his hat drawn over his eyes, Isaac Cook, the Quaker in strictest of raiment, Harold Littledale, the friend of Birkenhead and the critic of the dock board, Michael Belcher, the opulent and prosperous cotton broker, the two McCrays, the principal buyers of cotton for the trade, Tom Bold, the active Tory political tactician, who in olden days knew the value of every freeman's vote. H. T. Wilson, the founder of the White Star Line and the Napoleon of the Tory party. Edmund Thompson, the pioneer of steamers to the Brazils, who, like most pioneers, was unsuccessful. John Newell, the king of the cotton market, who had an enormous clientele of very wealthy men. C. K. Priolo, the representative of the Confederate government, who was also the great blockade-runner. Mrs. Priolo was considered to be the most beautiful woman in Liverpool. Mr. Priolo built the house in Abercrombie Square, which the bishop now occupies as his palace. R. L. Bolton, a very successful and bold operator in cotton, 
though in appearance the most shy and timid of men, was another well-known figure. He rarely made his appearance until late in the day, being credited with a love of turning night into day. James Cox, the opulent bachelor, doyen of the nitrate trade, held his court always well attended in one corner of the room. I well remember J. Aspinall Tobin, tall of stature, distinguished in appearance, fluent of speech, a welcome speaker on every Tory platform. John Dennison, famous for his little dinners and excellent port. Sam Gath, the tallest man on the exchange. Joseph Leather, the forceful partner in Marriott's, a leading nonconformist, who built and lived at Cleveley, Allerton. Morris Williams, the writer of a cotton circular, and a reputed oracle on cotton. He lived at Allerton Priory, afterwards bought and rebuilt by Mr. John Grant Morris. Thomas Hay, the courtly and stately chief of Hay and Company cotton brokers, Edwin Hay, his son, and the most vivacious and talkative of men, popular with all. Lloyd Rayner and his brother Edward, the largest brokers in general produce. S. Bigland, plain and honest of speech. The two Reynolds, skilled in Sea Island and Egyptian cotton. John Joynson and his brother Moses. John Bigham, portly and prosperous, and not far away his son, John C. Bigham, who was destined soon to leave the room and become the able Queen's counsel, the learned president of the Admiralty and Divorce Court, and afterwards a peer of the realm, Lord Mersey, and whose brilliant career was doubtless largely due to his early business training. Studley Martin, the active secretary to the Cotton Brokers Association, buzzing about like a busy bee, collecting opinions as to the amount of business doing in cotton. Thomas Bouch, the dignified representative of the old firm of Waterhouse and Sons. Edgar Musgrove, an ideal broker, ever present and ever active. Nor must I forget the noble band of ship brokers who collected the cargoes for ships loading outwards, Robert Ashley, Lewis Moores, W. J. Tomlinson, J. B. Walmsley, John McDiarmid, Robert Vining, Dash Berglin, Tom Moss, G. Warren, S. P. Guion, all of whom, with many others, represented vigorous interests which in those days made the trade of Liverpool. Outside the exchange, but yet very necessary to the success of its business, were the lawyers and insurance brokers and average adjusters. Amongst lawyers Mr. Bateson and Mr. Squarey enjoyed the largest commercial practice. R. N. Dale was the leading underwriter, and Mr. L. R. Bailey was not only very prominent as an average adjuster, but as an arbitrator he afterwards became one of the members for Liverpool. In those days, before the establishment of the system of trade arbitrations, there was abundant employment for lawyers and professional arbitrators. A sketch of the Liverpool Cotton Exchange would not be complete without a reference being made to the dealings of Maurice Ranger and others, who in the seventies on several occasions tried to corner the market by buying futures for delivery in a given month, and then obtaining such a control of the spot market as would prevent the sellers fulfilling their contracts. Mr. Ranger's operations were on a gigantic scale, but there was always a, quote, nigger on the fence, unquote. The unexpected happened, and I do not think he ever fully succeeded in these enterprises. He had many imitators who were equally unsuccessful. Mr. Joseph B. Morgan did a useful work for the cotton trade by establishing the cotton bank to facilitate clearances in future contracts. The removal of the cotton exchange to the new premises has taken place since my active business days, and the whole course and methods of the trade have changed. Commerce In the sixties, sailing ships filled the Liverpool docks, and fully one half of them flew the American flag. The great trades of Liverpool were those carried on with America, Australia, Calcutta, and the West Coast. 
the clipper ships belonging to James Baines and Company, and H. T. Wilson and Company, were renowned for their fast passages to Melbourne, while the East India and West Coast ships of James Beasley and Company, Imry and Tomlinson, McNearmid and Greenshields, and the Brocklebanks were justly celebrated for their smartness and sea-going qualities. Charles MacIver ruled over the destinies of the Cunard Company, and this line then paid one-third of the Liverpool dock dues. Mr. MacIver was a man of resolute purpose and a power in Liverpool. In the early volunteer days he raised a regiment of field artillery, a thousand strong, which he commanded. Many stories are told of his stern love of discipline. A captain of one of the Mediterranean steamers asked his permission as a special favor to be allowed to take his wife on a voyage with him. Mr. MacIver, whilst granting the request, remarked that it was contrary to the regulations of the Cunard Company. The captain, upon proceeding to join his ship with his wife, to his surprise found another captain in command, and a letter from Mr. MacIver enclosing a return passenger ticket for himself and his wife. Mr. Inman was building up the fortunes of the Inman line, and was the first to study and profit by the Irish emigration trade. The Bibbies and James Moss and Company practically controlled the Mediterranean trade. The tramp steamer was then unknown, and outside the main lines of steamers there were few vessels. But the Allens were forcing their way to the front, and Mr. Ismay was establishing the White Star Line, which revolutionized Atlantic travel. Mr. Alfred Holt was doing pioneer work in the West India trade, with some small steamers with single engines. These he sold and went into the China trade, in which he has built up a great concern. The Harrisons were sailing ship owners, but they had also a line of small steamers trading to Charente. They afterwards started steamers to the Brazils and to Calcutta. Looking back, they appear to have been most unsuitable vessels, but freights were high, and to Messrs. T. and J. Harrison belongs the credit of quickly finding out the most suitable steamer for long voyages, and always keeping their fleets well up to date. We must not forget to mention the merchants of Liverpool, for in those days the business of a merchant was very different from that of today. He had to take long and far-sighted views, as there was no such thing as hedging or covering by a sale of futures. His business required enterprise, and the exercise of care and good judgment. Among our most active merchants we had T. and J. Brocklebank, Finley, Campbell and Company, Baring Brothers, Brown, Shipley and Company, Malcolmson and Company, Charles Saunders, Sandback, Tin and Company, William Moon and Company, Ogilvy Gallanders and Company, T. and W. Earle and Company, J. K. Gilliatt, J. H. Schroeder and Company, Rankin, Gilmer and Company, and others. In the sixties Liverpool had two great trades. The entrepot trade, the produce of the world, centered in Liverpool, and was from thence distributed to the various ports on the continent. The opening of the Suez Canal and the establishment of foreign lines of steamers have largely destroyed this trade, and produce now finds its way direct to Genoa, Antwerp, and Hamburg. The other great trade was in American produce. For this Liverpool offered the largest and best market. This trade is unfortunately seriously threatened. The increase in the population of America is now making large demands upon her productions, and reducing the quantities available for export. Liverpool was also a considerable manufacturing centre. It was the principal place for rice-milling and sugar-refining, while shipbuilding and the making of locomotives and marine engines contributed largely to her prosperity. One cannot review the past trade of Liverpool and its present economic surroundings without feeling some anxiety for the future. Not only have the trades which so long made Liverpool their headquarters been to some extent diverted, but the efforts of rival ports, in many cases railway ports, 
or ports which have little or no concern as to the payment of interest on the money employed in their construction, are directed to the capture of our trade. In this they are still being actively assisted by the railway companies, who grant to them preferential rates of carriage. There can be little doubt that our merchants and shipowners will find new avenues for their enterprise, and new trades will take the place of those partially lost. But Liverpool has in front of her a fight to obtain the just advantage of her geographical position, and it is a fight in which the city must bear its part. The city will also have to adopt a more enlightened policy, and encourage manufacturing industries. This can only be done by reductions in the city rates, and also in the charges for water. The loss would only be nominal. We should be recouped by an increased volume of trade, and by our people obtaining steady occupation, instead of the present casual employment. THE AMERICAN WAR The great war between the northern and southern states of America, which was waged from 1861 to 1865, had a far-reaching influence upon Liverpool. Prior to this date American shipping filled our docks, and eighty-two per cent of our cotton imports were derived from the southern states. The election of Lincoln as President of the United States, and the rejection of the Democratic candidate, precipitated a crisis which had been long pending. Slavery was a southern institution, and although it was conducted in the most humane manner, and many of the worst features of the system were absent, the principle of slavery was abhorrent to a large section of the northern people, and the South feared that with the election of Lincoln this section would become all-powerful. South Carolina was the first state to assert her sovereign right to secede from the Union. Other states followed slowly and with hesitating steps, and by the end of 1861 the North and South were engaged in mortal combat. The southern states were ill-equipped for the struggle. They had no war material, and were dependent for clothing and many of the necessities of life upon the northern manufacturers. The policy of the north, therefore, was to establish a blockade of the south, both by land and by sea, which caused prices of many commodities to rapidly advance in the south, and cotton, their main export, to quickly decline in value. The English people sympathized with the South, as the weaker power, and also having been actively associated with them in trade. The arrest of the southern envoys Mason and Slidell, upon the British mail steamer Trent, by the Federal commander, did not improve the relationship between Great Britain and the government at Washington, and created ill feeling against the North. Under these circumstances, Liverpool merchants fitted out many costly expeditions to run the blockade, and to carry arms and munitions of war into the southern ports. The modus operandi was to send out a depot ship to Nassau or Bermuda, and employ, in connection with this, swift steamers to run the blockade and bring back cargoes of cotton. The profits of the trade were great, but the risk was also very considerable. The trade at best was a very questionable one. It was justified on the ground that a blockade cannot be recognized unless effectual. The United States started with a blockading fleet of 150 vessels, but at the end of the war they had 750 vessels employed in this service. The blockade runner had to rely entirely upon her speed as to fire a gun in her own defense, would at once have constituted her a piratical vessel. The fastest steamers were bought and built for the purpose. They usually made the American coast many miles from the port, and then under the cover of darkness they stole along the shore until they came to the blockading fleet, when they made a dash for the harbor. It was exciting work, and appealed to many adventurous spirits, and the prize, if successful, was great. I think all this had a demoralizing influence upon Liverpool's commercial life, and the intense spirit of speculation created by the cotton famine was also very injurious. 
Fortunes were made and lost in a single day. Prices of cotton, while peace and war hung in the balance, fluctuated violently, and when war was seen to be inevitable, they advanced with fearful rapidity. A shilling per pound was soon reached. The mills went upon short time. By the summer of 1862, cotton was quoted at two shillings six per pound. The speculative fever became universal. Men made fortunes by a single deal. When the recoil came after the war, most of these fortunes were lost again. Legitimate trade had been sacrificed to speculation. Mansions luxuriously furnished, picture galleries, horses, and carriages had to be sold, and in not a few instances their owners, having lost both their legitimate business and their habits of industry, were reduced to penury and want, and were never able to recover themselves. The results of the war were far-reaching. The spirit of speculation was rampant for many years, with disastrous results. It was only when a system of weekly and bi-weekly settlements was introduced that speculation was brought within legitimate limits. A nemesis seemed to follow this violent outburst of speculation, and but few houses actively engaged in it survived very long. Liverpool was also active in assisting the South to build and fit out vessels of war to prey upon American commerce. The Alabama was built at Birkenhead. She sailed away to a remote island, and there took on board her armament. She and her sister ship, the Shenandoah, did immense damage to American shipping, for which England had in the end to pay, as by the Geneva arbitration she was held responsible for allowing the Alabama to be built and escape. American shipping has never recovered from this blow, but it is only fair to say that the cost of shipbuilding in America, by reason of her prohibitive tariffs, has mainly prevented her resuming her former position on the ocean. THE SOUTHERN BAZAAR Near the close of the war a huge bazaar was held in St. George's Hall, in aid of the southern prisoners of war. It was designated the Southern Bazaar, and the stalls were called after the various states and were presided over by the leading ladies of the town, assisted by many of the nobility and society people. It was a brilliant success. Money was plentiful, and men and women vied with each other in scattering it about. Upwards of thirty thousand pounds was realized in the three days. THE VOLUNTEER MOVEMENT No account of the doings in Liverpool in the sixties would be complete that did not describe the beginnings of the great volunteer movement, which was destined to occupy so much public attention, and to form such an important portion of our national defense. Liverpool can certainly claim to have initiated the movement. Mr. Boosfield endeavored to revive this branch of the service in 1853. A few years later he formed a drill club, a very modest beginning, consisting of only one hundred men wearing as their uniform a cap and shell jacket. Captain Boosfield endeavored several times to obtain recognition by the government, but failed, and he had to encounter a considerable amount of chaff and ridicule. The public had but little sympathy with the young men who, quote, played at being soldiers, unquote. Captain Boosfield was not discouraged. He loved soldiering, and was an enthusiast and his opportunity was soon to arrive. In 1859 the Emperor Napoleon III became very threatening in his words and ways, and it was apprehended that he might attempt to invade our shores. Captain Boosfield quickly obtained the support of the government for his volunteers, and the 1st Lancashire Volunteer Regiment was formed. The movement made rapid headway, until we had enrolled in the country upwards of three hundred thousand men. Colonel Boosfield soon obtained the command of a battalion, and in 1860 was presented with a sword of honor and a purse of eighteen hundred pounds. Liverpool furnished her full quota of volunteers. Colonel Brown commanded a regiment of artillery, Colonel Tilney the 5th Lancashire, a crack regiment. 
Colonel McCorkadale, the press guards. Colonel Bourne, with Major Melly and Captain Hornby, afterwards Colonel H. H. Hornby, the 1st Lancashire Artillery. Colonel MacIver commanded a thousand of his own men, and among other active volunteers at this time we remember Colonel Stiebel, Colonel McPhee, Colonel Morrison, Colonel Clay, and many others. We also had a squadron of cavalry, called the Liverpool Light Horse, Captain Stone in command. I joined the squadron in 1859, and greatly fancied myself mounted on one of my father's carriage horses. We exercised in some fields behind Prospect Vale, Fairfield. I remember the first Lancashire being encamped on the sand hills between Waterloo and Blundellsands. It was the first time any volunteers had been under canvas, and the camp was visited by crowds of people. INTELLECTUAL LIFE Liverpool has been always too much absorbed in her commerce to take any prominent position in the world of literature and education, until recent years, when we have atoned in some degree for our remissness in the past, by the founding of our university. Professor Ramsey Muir, in a recent speech, however, claims that we had a renaissance in Liverpool in the early years of the nineteenth century, when a group of thinkers, scholars, and writers, finding its center in William Roscoe, gave to Liverpool a position and a name in the literary world, and she became a real seat of literary activity. To that remarkable man, William Roscoe, we owe the Athenium, the Literary and Philosophical Society, and the Roscoe collection of pictures now in the Walker Art Gallery. This intellectual effort quickly lost its vitality, and for long years the Literary and Philosophical Society and the Philomathic Society struggled alone to keep burning the light of higher culture and literary activity. Elementary education was almost entirely in the hands of the church. Middle-class education depended upon the Liverpool Collegiate, the Mechanics Institute, afterwards the Liverpool Institute, and the Royal Institution. The fashion of sending boys to our great public schools did not set in until the seventies. Such was the condition of intellectual life when, in 1880, the Liverpool University College was established, mainly through the efforts of the late Earl of Derby, William Rathbone, Christopher Bushell, E. K. Muspret, David Jardine, Sir Edward Lawrence, Robert Gladstone, Mr. Muspratt, Sir John Brunner, John Rankin, and William Johnston. The first principal, Dr. Rendell, rendered excellent service in these early struggling years, which were happily followed by still greater and even more successful efforts under Vice-Chancellor Dale, resulting in the granting of a royal charter in 1903, and the founding of a university. The Earl of Derby became Chancellor, and Dr. Dale Vice-Chancellor. The university has been nobly and generously supported by Liverpool men. Indeed, a reference to the calendar fills me with surprise that so much could have been accomplished within such a brief period. Its work is making itself felt in the general uplifting of the level of education, while the presence in Liverpool of such a distinguished body of professors has had considerable influence in giving a higher and more intellectual tone to society, and in opening up new avenues for thought and activity. We must not omit to record the excellent work done by the school board. When first established in 1873, the election of members provoked such sectarian animosity, but in the course of time, through the exertions of Mr. Christopher Bushell and Mr. Sam Rathbone, this hindrance to the success was overcome, and the excellence of its organization was generally recognized. Its functions have, during the past few years, been transferred to the city council. One of the results of the school board was the founding of the Council of Education, which provided, in the shape of scholarships, the means by which boys could advance from the elementary school to the higher grade schools and the universities. 
Mr. Sam Rathbone, Mr. Gilmore, and Mr. Bushell were very active in promoting this association. SOCIETY IN LIVERPOOL Society was much more exclusive forty or fifty years ago than it is today. The old Liverpool families were looked up to with much respect. The American War considerably disturbed Liverpool society, and brought to the front many new people. Liverpool became more cosmopolitan and democratic, but there was no serious departure from the old-world courtesy of manner and decorum in dress until the eighties, when it gradually became fashionable to be less exacting in dress, and the customs of society grew less conventional. In the sixties people of wealth and position surrounded themselves with certain attributes of power and wealth, which gave to the populace some indication of their rank and their social status, and in manners they were reserved and dignified. Their homes were in the country or in the fashionable suburbs of the city, and their importance was measured by the extent of their broad acres. A house in London in which they dwelt for three or four months of the year was the luxury only of the older families, or of those with great wealth. The fashion of having a flat in London, with a weekend cottage in the country, was not known. This has followed the more democratic tendencies of our times. The bringing of people together in our railway trains, in steamers, in hotel lounges, and foreign travel, have had a distinctly leveling influence. In the sixties some old country families still made their annual pilgrimage to visit their friends in the family coach, and the circle of their acquaintances was limited and exclusive. The family carriage, with the rumble at the back, was a dignified and well-turned-out equipage. The dress carriage, with powdered footmen, was commonly seen in Hyde Park, and was de rigueur at court drawing-rooms, then held in the afternoon. The array of carriages at these functions made a splendid show. Motors may have the charm of convenience and speed, but can never replace the smart appearance of the well-turned-out carriage and pair. The sixties were the days of crinoline and poke bonnets, and although the wearing of crinoline was much ridiculed, Ladies' dress in those days was much more becoming and graceful than many of our more recent fashions, and girls have never looked more fascinating than when they wore their pretty little bonnets. But perhaps I may be called old-fashioned. As we grow older our viewpoints change. We had many old maids in those days. We have none now and the old ladies with their hair worn in dainty curls, surmounted by a lace cap, were picturesque and looked their part. The Wellington rooms, which were opened in 1814, were regarded as the center of fashionable society. These rooms, which are only used five times in each year, are unique in their exquisite proportions and their charming Adams decorations, unspoiled by the modern painter and decorator. The floor of the large ballroom is celebrated for its spring, being, it is stated, suspended by chains. Admission to the rooms was carefully safeguarded, its members belonging almost exclusively to the families of position and standing. The balls were conducted on the strictest lines of propriety, carefully enforced by vigilant stewards, who would not admit of any rough dancing, and such a thing as kitchen lancers would not have been tolerated. Six or seven balls were given each year. The first before Christmas was often called the dirty frock ball, as new frocks were reserved for the debutante's ball, the first ball of the season. No supper was given, only very light and indifferent refreshments. The attendance gradually fell away, and it was felt that the time had arrived when something should be done to revive their interest. Accordingly, about 1890, during my presidency, the supper room was enlarged, electric light was introduced, and a supper with champagne provided, and in order to meet the extra expense, the balls were cut down to five. These changes were very successful in increasing the attendance. 
there were great misgivings as to the introduction of the electric light, and its effect upon the complexions of the ladies. The old form of illumination by wax candles suffused a very soft light, but the candles were unreliable, and often did damage to ladies' dresses. In the sixties the only outdoor games played were cricket and croquet. Of the most striking developments of modern days is the time now devoted to games, especially to golf and lawn tennis. In the sixties the facilities for getting about were very limited. The public conveyances consisted of a few four-horse buses, which started from Castle Street. Today the bicycle and motor-car bridge over distances with rapidity and little fatigue, to make us familiar with the beauties of our country, which was in old days impossible, while the electric tram carries the working man to his game at football or to his cottage in the suburbs. All this is a great gain, adding new interests to life, and is also very conducive to health and happiness. The conditions of life during the past fifty years in every grade of society have greatly improved. They are brighter, healthier, and happier. There has been a decrease in the consumption of alcohol, less intemperance, and a striking diminution in crime and pauperism. With an increase of over fifty percent in the population, there is less crime. While the necessaries of life have not increased in cost, wages are from twenty-five to fifty percent higher, and the working classes no longer live in damp cellars or in dark courts and alleys, but have at their disposal cheerful, sanitary, and convenient homes. End of section five.